Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, for the uh, invitation again to present at the IIF. Um, I think it's been a couple of months since I've been uh, I've been here to talk about defense and the products we're developing, and um, we were actually pretty busy developing uh, new products for moving the um, <clears throat> the pipeline we have so far forward. So what I'll be doing today is I'll be presenting a uh, an exciting project about a cell cancer vaccine we're developing as a second generation or as a follow-up to the initial cancer vaccine we call the ARM. So uh, before I go into the core of the presentation, I'd like to just remind the uh, viewers about the uh, technology and what we're aiming to resolve in the biomedical field. So... <laughs> If you have any kind of therapy, whether it's a protein, DNA, RNA, antibody, ADC, any of these proteins or products uh, will be taken up by a cell via a process called endocytosis, which is you know, capturing something from the extracellular space to bring it inside the cell. And so the way I see these endosomes is like, like stomach. So basically they capture the product and then they degrade them in order to really retrieve any, uh, let's say, peptide or product they can basically use in the cell as a source of nutrient or for energy or metabolism and whatnot. So you can imagine that this kind of approach is problematic if you're trying to deliver a product directly inside the cell to be able to reach, let's say, the nucleus or the microtubules or anything you'd like to inhibit. So um, in order to really um, in, and, and that becomes a major problem, as I mentioned, to any of these different therapies you're trying to develop. So in order to really bypass this issue, uh, we are using the Acum platform, which is a, a small molecule composed of the bile acid fused to a peptide sequence, um, which could be a nuclear localization signal or any kind of other peptide sequence that will target specific areas in the cell. And what this technology basically allow us to do is to promote what we call endosome to cytosol escape. So we're trying to basically leave the endosome before the acidity takes place, before we start seeing degradation of the product. So that will ensure that your vaccine or antibody drug conjugate or any other molecule you're trying to deliver will get into the cytosol and eventually leave or enter other uh, organelles in the cell, such as the nucleus, or even act in the cytosol if that's where it should be. And so um, in order for me to basically really show you how this technology works, here's an example which I always uh, promote or give to visually demonstrate how this technology operates in a cell. So, you know, we all know that sugar residues are found on the cell membrane or they could be found within the endosomal lumen. So that's because, you know, when the cell membrane is outside and then it closes up to form the endosome, everything that was in the cell membrane ends up being within the endosome. So if you overexpress in a dendritic cell line, for example, a fusion protein composed of the galactin-3, which is a protein that binds to carbohydrates, fused to the GFP so it can follow up the signal, you'll notice here that the entire cell is green, meaning that you have normal distribution of the product everywhere in the cell, so it's not really localized to one area more than another. So if you if you pulse the cell with, um, with an antigen, nothing really happens. Now, if you take that same antigen and you uh, tag on it or bioconjugate on it the AQ molecule, what ends up happening now is that this AQ will start breaking down the membrane of the endosome, which allows this galactin-3 to go freely in or out of the endosome. So that's really a bidirectional uh, movement, and that's where you start seeing those puncti of green appearing in the cell, meaning that now the human galactin-3 protein is basically able to reach the carbohydrates in the endosome and bind to them specifically. So you're really relocalizing the, the fusion protein directly in the endosome. So, so that really shows you how potent and how effective is this molecule at breaking endosomal membranes, allowing any product to escape in or out uh, in the, of, of the endosome. And of course, uh, as a proof of concept, as one of the proof of concepts we've generated, we've demonstrated that we can we can actually promote or enhance the anti-tumoral response of dendritic cell-based vaccines, which we all know have been there since the late 90, 1990s, and they all fail for multiple reasons, going from manufacturing to efficacy. So in this in this study, which we published in Cell Reports Medicine. 
uh, about two years ago, we were able to demonstrate that in fact we can we can go from zero percent survival to up to seventy percent survival. So that's a huge improvement in the anti-tumor response of uh, this vaccine strategy. So <clears throat> based on this um, magnificent uh, observation and the development, we then built um, you know many verticals around this highly versatile technology. So we went from that simple a Q molecule, which could just deliver uh, proteins or, or any product into the cell, into the development of cell-based vaccines, protein or mRNA-based vaccines. We even have, you know, um, impressive data demonstrated that we can, we can, we can change the Q molecule by, you know, changing the bile acid or the peptide sequence and come up with molecules that exhibit anti-cancer properties. So they can kill cancer cells on their own. We've also uh, demonstrated uh, very elegantly that we can augment the anti-tumoral efficacy of FDA-approved ADCs, and the company is currently right now developing its own in-house antibody drug conjugates from A to Z. So the antibody with the linker with the with the molecule itself. So lots of excitements in the company, lots of developments based on this highly versatile technology. But today I'll be focusing again on the cell-based vaccine to show you how we went from the first generation to the uh, second generation. So this table here uh, shows you basically the overall pipeline we have currently in development. So um, initially we were able to demonstrate that we can we can develop what we call an A1 reprogram as in stromal cell-based vaccine, which we call the ARM. Uh, and that was um, designed specifically for solid tumors indications. So if we have access, let's say, to tumor lysate, we can develop a vaccine based on that. But now we're moving to a second generation, which is even more potent, and I'll show you how this will affect the manufacturing process, which we have decided to call ARM-X. And by the way, this program is is, is pretty well advanced. Uh, we're moving We're moving now to the... Uh, to the dry run. So we're really manufacturing the product in clean room and we're hoping to be able to start a phase one trial in uh, Q2 or Q3 of uh, 2024. In parallel to that, we've got the Acutox program, which is a, a variant of the Acume, which as I mentioned earlier, could have uh, very powerful anti-cancer properties. And in fact, we were able to show that it's pretty potent against melanoma, breast cancer, We've even shown that we can use it in the context of uh, cervical cancer. So any solid tumor, basically, that you can inject directly could be a uh, target of the Acutox program. Not only that, but we were able to um, bring it forward in, in a new formulation to be able to be used in the context of lung cancer. In this case, we're using a device to really deliver the product as an inhaled uh, solution or inhaled, uh, you know, um, formulation. So now there's no invasiveness in this approach at all with amazing uh, data obtained so far. And in fact, uh, with respect to the Acutox, uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we've got uh, the, the clearance by the FDA to move on to a phase one clinical trial uh, against a basket of solid tumors. And that's work in progress right now. We're uh, really establishing the site to be able to start a phase one trial against solid tumors uh, this year. <clears throat> now, in addition to all this, uh, we've got cell-based vaccines, we've got the Acutox, but now we also have uh, an example of how we can use protein-based vaccines against other cancers or cancer indication. Uh, for example, uh, we were able to use a tumor-specific antigen that is overexpressed in cervical cancer, and we've demonstrated uh, this is work that has been published. We've demonstrated that we can basically use that vaccine either prophylactically, i.e. before the cancer is established, or therapeutically in combination with immune checkpoints to really control tumor growth. And in fact, that same vaccine could not only be used against cervical cancer, but you can also use it in the context of head and neck cancer. So that's another product we're aiming to push eventually uh, to clinical trials. And of course, um, as I mentioned, we've got antibody drug conjugates in development, as well as a program on mRNA vaccination against, you know, multiple indications in cancer, as well as infectious diseases. So I'll be focusing now mostly on the ARM vaccine and how, what, what are the limitations of the ARM vaccine and how we were able to bypass these limitations to make the product even better. 
So what are mesenchymal cells, which are the source of this cell-based vaccine? These are cells that have been mainly used in the field of regenerative medicine. So uh, those of you that know these cells know that they've been used mainly after um, uh, heart you know, infractus, for example, to repair ischemic tissues, uh, repairing skin, repairing any kind of tissue that has been damaged because they have this ability to regenerate, differentiate into cells of mesenchymal origin. There are over 6,500 studies out there really describing the potency of these cells. You've got also amazing immune suppressive properties uh, that were actually describing these cells, especially in the field of multiple sclerosis, graft versus host disease, after bone marrow transplant, and other indications. But, you know, what makes these cells really interesting is the fact that they have properties that are quite attractive for any company that is aiming to use them in a cell therapy approach. Uh, first of all, they're easily harvested. Initially, we, we thought they were only from the bone marrow, but now we know that we can isolate them from a variety of different tissues. They can generate very high yield of cells. You know, from a single bone marrow aspirate, you can reach billions and billions of cells. They've got a fantastic... Safety profile, as shown by the hundreds and hundreds of clinical trials that have been conducted and completed so far, they've got this plasticity, meaning that you can actually, if you find a way to push them to behave one way over another, you can actually adapt them to any, any kind of issue or problem. And that's exactly what we've been doing in the sense that, yes, we know they have this immune, immune suppressive property and regenerative property. But we were able to show through various publications that we can reprogram these cells, either genetically or pharmacologically, to behave as antigen-presenting cells. So now they can actually promote an inflammatory response. They can activate the immune system to recognize uh, specific antigens or attack you know, viruses or cancer cells. So that is, is quite impressive because now we've established, and we're basically the leaders in the field, where we have shown that we can establish a third main function for these cells that is uh, not related to immune regeneration, uh, sorry, immune suppression or uh, regenerative medicine. <laughs> so this is just a reminder of the, the, the initial studies that were conducted. So we've demonstrated that these cells, if they are basically uh, treated with a protein in combination with the acute variant, could actually activate uh, T cells. And that's the A1 we've initially discovered capable of reprogramming those cells into antigen presenting cells. And in fact, uh, when we tested this ARM vaccine as an allogeneic subcutaneously universal vaccine delivered into animals that have pre-established tumors, we were able to demonstrate that we could uh, have a very powerful anti-tumoral response, whether the product is delivered as a monotherapy, as shown here by the purple line, or in combination with immune checkpoints like anti-PD-1, where there you can see a 90% complete response achieved in these animals. So that was very interesting, very impressive, exciting for us, exciting for the community. But what we have to keep in mind is that it requires a, a, a lot of protein. So it requires practically 0.5 milligram per ml of protein lysate in order to really uh, be able to engineer the vaccine. So if you're delivering, for example, 15 or you know, 30 million uh, cells as a dose, you would probably require something like uh, 70 to 90 milligram of tumor mass to be able to generate the vaccine. It's not unfeasible, but it just means that we need to have access to patients that have you know, uh, easily resectable uh, large tumors to be able to actually generate the vaccine. So with this in mind, you know, uh, we, we, in parallel to this project, we're working on the Acutox, as I mentioned, as an injectable. This is um, something that we've submitted for publication. So th this slide here shows you a little bit what Acutox can do. So it's a molecule that kills cancer cells and it does so uh, you know, in different, uh, at different levels. It induces what we call an immunogenic cell death, meaning that it will attract the immune system while killing the cells. It's able to really produce reactive oxygen species, which are really toxic. These are byproducts that are usually generated through respiration of the cell in the mitochondria. They're pretty toxic for the cell. So the cell has a lot of different mechanisms to basically um, counteract the product, the production or neutralize them to be able to remove them from the system. 
But if you actually <clears throat> if you actually have a little bit higher amount of ROS inside the cell, you can drive the cell crazy and eventually kill it. So that's one of the mechanisms that the molecule uses to basically kill cancer cells. In addition to that, uh, we've demonstrated through transcriptomic analysis that it's able to really disrupt this P53 uh, mode of, uh, you know, uh, defense mechanism, P53 target genes that are there to really make sure that the cell is either, you know, rescued or not rescued, but rather, rather you know, producing genes that are there to protect the genome or the genes of the cells from being attacked by the ROS. So we're really targeting multiple levels in the cell, which makes it hard for the cancer cell to defend itself. Now, while doing these analyses, we, we stumble upon something pretty interesting, which is uh, the fact that Acutox also makes the, the tumor cells immunogenic, meaning they have this ability to enhance their antigen presentation. So it's like if you're, because usually the immune system sees a cell through the peptides that are presented on the cell surface via HLA molecules or MHC molecules. So that's how the immune system will be able to discern between a cancer cell and a healthy cell. If they see something unusual, they attack the cell. So, so this is here represented by these, um, uh, for example, green molecules, which we are always calling MHC class one or HLA A2, for example. And the peptide here was shown in, 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 in red represents something that is either coming from a mutant protein or a normal protein. So that's how the CDT cells, for example, can recognize whether this is a healthy or sick cell. So we've noticed that Acutox basically could enhance this, this antigen presentation process, which is usually inhibited in the field of cancer and in, in, in the process of cancer development because the tumor needs to kind of hide itself from the immune system. So now we're making it visible. We're making it, you know, immunogenic. And therefore now the immune system can start attacking them. So when I saw this, I said, well, that's interesting because now the Acutox has something that we did not expect it to have initially. And so when we looked at this, we said, okay, well, this is the structure of the Acutox. Um, we've conducted then a, an antigen cross-presentation assay, which is like the assay I showed you initially with the cell, you treat it with ovalbumin as a protein, you treat it with the Acutox, and then you have a T cell responding. And there we, we used multiple doses of the Acutox. And as you can see here, you start seeing an increase in the activation of the T cells. So that's interesting because now it shows you that the Acutox, in addition of being an antitumoral molecule, so as an injectable, if you, if you lower the dose and you give it on those MSCs, which I've spoken about initially, you can make those cells now, you can reprogram them to make them antigen presenting cells. And in fact, um, we've done, you know, multiple concentrations uh, of the protein lysate. As you recall, I said initially that we needed 0.5 milligram per ml of antigen to really be able to have a detectable immune response. In this case, we tested multiple doses of the antigen going from 1 milligram per ml to 0.001 milligram per ml. And as you can see here, we are able to get a very good anti-tumoral response or a T-cell activation, sorry, a T-cell activation in this case, using a dose that is 10 times lower than the dose we used to actually work with. So now we can do the same thing, not using 0.5 milligram per ml, but we can do it with 0.05 milligram per ml. So from a manufacturing standpoint, this is extremely important because now instead of needing, let's say, 70 milligram of protein, we only need seven milligram, which is even smaller. So 10 times less material to engineer the vaccine. So um, this is exactly what I've just mentioned to you. So does the Acutox retain the same uh, efficacy or the same properties as the initial A1 molecule? For example, does it break the endosomal membrane? This is a neat experiment, which we're always using. We've established in our lab and we're always using it to demonstrate this process. Um, if you take a cell, for example, and you treat it with cytochrome C, cytochrome C is usually retained in the mitochondria. So it's a very toxic molecule because it will activate the caspases, which will kill a, a cell. So usually if it's captured by the endosome, as I mentioned initially, the endosome is going to kill it, it's going to degrade it, it's going to damage the protein, so the protein won't be active. However, if you deliver the protein with the acutox and the acutox breaks down the endosome, then this molecule will reach the cytosol in its intact form and will activate apoptosis. 
That's exactly what we have demonstrated in this experiment. Whereas, you know, if you if you can look here, an XN5 is a signal that shows you that the cell is dying. So if you look here for a cell that is not treated with anything, they're all alive. Uh, if you treat it with Acutox, with small dose, not that much cell death happens. If you treat it with cytochrome C, cell is still alive. Now, if you mix both together, you can see that there is a shift towards the right, meaning that now the cell is, um, you know, positive for an XN5, meaning that the cell is dying or, or has been has been already, it's already dead. So what that experiment is showing us is that the Acutox in this case like A1 could break the endosomal membrane, allowing the delivery of the antigen into the uh, cytosol. Now, we, we don't have yet, where this is work in progress. So right now we're working on demonstrating that the um, MSCs treated with Acutox could really induce a powerful anti-tumor response. However, we did another study right before that, uh, during the Christmas uh, period uh, last year, where we said, okay, well, how about I take, for example, the Acutox and I just mix it with protein lysate. So instead of taking that and add it on the MSCs, uh, reprogram the MSCs and then inject those, I just took the protein lysate and the Acutox, mixed them together, and then delivered that product to mice that had uh, tumors pre-established. And there what we noticed is that, um, in fact, when you do that and you combine this vaccine, this protein lysate Acutox mix, with anti-PD-1 as shown in red, you could actually have a nice anti-tumor response taking place. And in fact, if you look at the survival curve over time, we were able to get about 40% survival. Now, this was just a preliminary experiment for us to demonstrate that this Acutox is actually behaving the way it should. And now we're expecting the uh, cell-based therapy to actually raise that 40% to 100%. And so the reason why we are uh, we're keen on this experiment is just to show you that although you can use it in the context of protein-based vaccination, although this is not optimal, uh, we can actually have a much better effect with the cell-based vaccine, which is an incentive to use the cell-based vaccine over protein vaccination in this case. So uh, work in progress, and hopefully in the next meeting, I'll be able to show you some exciting data on the cell-based vaccine. So as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the ARM, ARM X, uh, is being currently manufactured in the CPC, the Cell Processing Center. Uh, we're conducting uh, three different dry runs, which we'll be presenting to Health Canada very soon in order to get clearance to move on to a phase one trial uh, by Q2 or Q3 of this year, uh, hopefully. So in summary, what I've shown you today is that uh, we're able to convert MSCs into antigen-presenting cells using the Acutox variant, which is something novel in the company, knowing that Acutox, as I mentioned initially, is mainly used in the context of an injectable molecule. Uh, we've shown that the ARMX cells can effectively cross-present extracellular antigens to responding T cells. That's the assay I've shown in the antigen cross-presentation in vitro. Compared to A1, Acutox requires 10 times less protein to be able to achieve the same, the same objective, which from a manufacturing point of view is quite impressive. It retains its ability to break the endosome akin to A1, which is, again, uh, reassuring us that even though the molecule is more effective, it retains the innate properties of the parental molecule. Um, it, it, based on our preliminary data with the protein mix with the Acutox, we've shown that we can have an immune response against a tumor uh, that could work in, in, in conjunction with the anti-PD-1 uh, immunotherapy. So that's something that is encouraging us to move this project forward with the cell-based vaccine. And hopefully we, we should be able to uh, present to Health Canada some very important and interesting dry runs that will uh, provide us with the clearance to move on to a phase one for a basket of solid tumors. So you've got in here the contact information of uh, the company. Please feel free to get in touch with us if you have further questions, if you'd like to uh, dig in a little bit more into the data or you're interested to know more about other projects, uh, would be, we'd be more than happy to basically have a discussion with, uh, with you guys. So thank you very much and I'll be more than happy to take questions. All right. Thank you very much for the great presentation, uh, Dr. Rafi. Obviously, uh, everyone who has questions, please provide them in the Q&A box or in the chat box. 
no matter what we will be reading them. Um, two things uh, that I want to emphasis on, uh, Doctor, today. I think your presentation is, again, very clear. Um, it, it sends out all, uh, new opportunities and it, it, it consolidates the work that you are already be doing. Uh, I know you were very, very active on social media, specifically on LinkedIn. There has been a lot of development in the past few months in the field, in companies in parallel to you, in with uh, other research institutes. Can you tell us a bit the, the the space in which you're working on? I mean, we hear a lot about, for example, in commodities, there's a big boom about the copper, about critical metals and so on. What exactly for people who do not know specifics about the pharmaceutical uh, sector, how exciting is the field you're working in right now? That's an excellent question, uh, <clears throat> Julien. And, and what we have to keep in mind is that a lot of those cancer immunotherapies right now that are available in the market are basically focused on the use of the immune checkpoints, uh, anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4, CD-47, and whatnot. There is a lot of interest in the field of antibody drug conjugates. All the pharmaceutical companies are developing an ADC. Um, and, and you know, we've heard a lot about CAR-T, which are uh, modified T cells expressing a chimeric antigen receptor, which are really focusing on killing, uh, killing cancer cells. The main problem with all of these technologies, um, well, first of all, with the immune checkpoints, although they're they're pretty vague in terms of their mode of action, they always rely on something else to really boost the anti-tumor response. If you give an anti-PD-1 alone, you might get 30% you know, improvement in survival in patients over a period of time, but it's when you give it in, in, in combination with something else that you can reach 50, 60, or even 70% improvement. So that's pretty good for the immune checkpoints. That's why all the pharmas are interested in developing second, third, fourth generation ICIs. In terms of the of the ADCs, uh, ADCs are uh, mostly designed, for example, in the context of breast cancer. Okay, uh, but the problem is, again, like CAR T, like any kind of cancer immunotherapy approach, we're always missing tumor specific antigens. Tumor associated antigens are not good. You know, they're expressed on our healthy cells, but overexpressed on cancer cells our immune system is tolerant towards them. So the main problem we're facing right now is let's find something that is specifically expressed by cancer cells. That's where personalized medicine is coming into, into play. AI, everybody's talking about AI, but we have to remember that if you want to apply AI to cancer, you have to make it personalized to that patient because what you find in that patient will not be found in the second patient, the third, the fourth, the fifth unless you find something that is commonly shared by all these patients, which at the moment we don't have. What we are doing right now is we're providing here a new technology that will bring back the idea of cancer vaccination. Everybody now knows the power of vaccination because of the COVID situation, but everybody has kept this bad memory about the DC vaccines which failed in 1991, 1992, and so on. So, we're saying, you know, you know, let's recycle what we've known about the DCs by, by using another set of technology. Let's use the tumor lysate, where now we don't care about the, the tumor-specific antigen. We don't need to know these because they're already specific to the patient. So we're coming back with a uh, universal off-the-shelf vaccine that will make people interested again in cancer vaccination. So overall, you know, in the field, people are interested to biologics, ADCs, antibodies, by specifics. The immune checkpoints, a lot of, you know, some, some companies work on oncolytic viruses, but a lot of interest in the CAR T. But the CAR T is always doing the same thing over and over again. CD19, CD20, CD22. Now people are trying to divert into the field of other targets for solid tumors, but not a lot of success at the moment. So that's where we are right now in the field. And what is defense therapeutic? Uh, what results are expected by the sector? to have someone to come in and partner and support your all your research into the next phase. Yeah. So so defense therapeutics um, is very distinct in, in the fact in, in the sense that they've got a molecule, they've got a platform that not only is highly versatile, we can go into different directions. But if you think about it uh, in a in a in a in a much broader way, this technology could be adapted to any product in development. So any pharmaceutical company that has an antibody drug conjugate, and we have an example right now, we're, we're working with a European uh, partner, uh, they've got this ADC, which 
which gives nice data, you know, the injected against cancer, it's, it's really working well, but you've got to deliver a huge amount of this ADC in animals to be able to reach their objective, their therapeutic potency. And when we, when we applied our acume on it, we were able to basically make that ADC 60 times better. So you can imagine that if you have an ADC in development and you come to us, well, if you're delivering that at, at I don't know, at 10 milligram per, per kilo, we can make it go down to two milligram per kilo or even lower than that. If you're delivering a protein-based vaccine, an mRNA vaccine, we can make sure that this vaccine will be 10, 20, 30 folds more efficient than the initial thing. So any company that will approach us will find solutions that will make their product actually 10, 20, 30, 50 times better. So yes, the company is developing its own products, but it's really open to a lot of partnerships. And here, the, the, the sky is the limit in the sense that we really don't see a limitation to where the technology could be brought forward. Well, this is a perfect closing statement. I couldn't ask for better, uh, Dr. Rafi. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much for the comments afterwards and uh, the update on uh, what's happening in your field in the sector. Um, and we will be very happy to see you again, either at the next eye after the one after, but we keep a very, very close eye to your results. And thank you very much for sharing them. Thank you very much for the invitation. Have a great day. Thank okay. you, you too.